Hey everybody, welcome back to our continuing coverage of the 160th anniversary of the Battle of Gettysburg. I'm Chris White with the American Battlefield Trust. We have Sarah K. Byerly behind the camera. Gary Edelman is off on another part of the field filming another video as we speak. So we have a lot of content that is coming your way here on the American Battlefield Trust YouTube channel. So we encourage you to check out all the other content we have for our 160 swings we're doing so far. That's 160th anniversary of Brandy Station, Chancellorsville, Port Hudson, Vicksburg, Gettysburg, and beyond. So check that out over on our YouTube channel. Also, please click that like and that subscribe button here on YouTube. Check out the American Battlefield Trust uh, website at battlefields.org. Learn a little bit more about what we do and why we do it. Um, and you can also learn more about our three wars that we cover, the War of 1812, the Civil War, and the American Revolutionary War. So this video, we plan to take you around Culp's Hill, tell you some stories of the hill, tell you some of the stories of the soldiers who fought here. But before we can get moving, uh, we're standing here down in Spangler's Meadow. Now, um, this Culp's Hill is actually owned by a couple different farmers, including Henry Spangler, whose house is out along the Baltimore Pike. It is one of the oldest houses in the entire county. You can't miss it as you drive up the Baltimore Pike towards Gettysburg. It's a private residence, but part of it's made out of log, part of it's made out of stone as you're driving up the road. And that um, is one of the oldest properties here in Adams County, Pennsylvania. And Henry Spangler owned this area we will call Spangler's Meadow. And Spangler's Meadow up until just a few years ago um, was a place you couldn't fully understand. And one of the reasons was because the Park Service didn't own all of the land out to an area called Powers Hill which will be uh, the vicinity of the Union 12th Corps slash right wing commander Henry Warner Slocum. And over there for a brief time will be George Gordon Meade on July 3rd. Uh, Powers Hill acts as an artillery platform, a troop staging position for the Federals. And they could fire off into this direction where behind the camera will be Confederates, especially on July 3rd, who had snuck up here on the evening of the second morning of the third and have taken what we call it Lower Culp's Hill named after the Culp family farm, which is just down East Confederate uh, Avenue uh, from where we're standing. East Confederate Avenue, I think, is 7,241 feet long. There's a p useless piece of information for you. Um, and uh, in this area, you would have the Federals, Confederates over there, and then kind of where we're standing is the no man's land. Uh, because off in the woods behind me, sometimes called McAllister's Woods. Um, in that area, you would have had the brigade of Silas Colgrove. Colgrove is in charge of Thomas Ruger's brigade, who's been bumped up to division because his division commander has been bumped up to core because Henry Slocum thinks he's in charge of the right wing of the entire army, which would be the 5th uh, and the, uh, uh, the fifth core and the 12th core and sometimes a six mixed in there, but he's not. Um, so Slocum doesn't exactly know his role during the battle from time to time, but in that knot of woods would be this very strange formation of federals, Colgrove's brigade. Then this open area here until you get off into the area of the Spangler farm out in an area known as Paraday Field, and then would run up to Upper Culp's Hill, that famous line of George Sears Green, which we'll, we'll explore, that was defended on the evening of July 2nd. Up to Culp's Hill, turn back on that fish hook towards East Cemetery Hill, then down Cemetery Ridge towards the Round Tops. So we are towards the extreme right flank, not the extreme right flank yet, uh, of the Union Army. The extreme right flank will be off in an area we call Lost Lane today on some private property and some park property too. It's really tough to get to. We filmed a video there a few years ago, but down in this area where we're standing on the morning of July 3rd will be one of the famous uh, forlorn hope charges of Gettysburg. And that will be the 2nd Massachusetts, Colonel Charles Mudge's 2nd uh, uh, Massachusetts and the 27th Indiana. They will be pushed out from those woods behind me, charging across Spangler's Meadow, meeting up with uh, Confederates uh, under the command of extra Billy Smith Virginians, as well as George Maryland Stewart's brigade, and they will be thrown back with grievous losses. Uh, in fact, Mudge will say of the orders, well, it's uh, those are orders, but it's murder, uh, to paraphrase him. And what ended up happening was it was really just some miscommunication from the Federal High Command. This assault should have never happened. But Spangler's Meadow is interesting um, to us because it's one of those open areas. The American Battlefield Trust has purchased land over on Powers Hill. We purchased land along the Baltimore Pike. We purchased land over on the old Zephyr Tawny Farm. So we are putting this portion of the battlefield 
back together. The National Park Service, as well as us, we have been helping to clear out and re uh, rehabilitate this land to bring it back to its 1863 appearance. We'll throw in there our friends at the Gettysburg Foundation who've done a lot of work on Upper Culp's Hill to bring that uh, battlefield back to its 1863 appearance using archeology, span photographs and other studies. So this is really that public-private partnership that you see going on between the American Battlefield Trust, the Gettysburg Foundation, as well as obviously the National Park Service here at Gettysburg. So if you haven't made your way out here to the Union right flank, the Confederate left flank, be sure to check it out. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a, a, a walk and a drive up and around Culp's Hill. We're gonna bring you some stories here of some post-war stories, some wartime stories, and uh, bring you up to speed here in 1863. So before we step off to our first stop, let me just tell you, it's July 2nd, 1863. Over on the Union left around 3.45 in the afternoon, a massive artillery bombardment starts, and then sometime around 4 o'clock to 4.15 in the afternoon, we will start to see the attacks at Devil's Den. Then Little Round Top. That will start to spread up to the wheat field, the peach orchard, and then up the Emmitsburg Road line. And as this is happening, George Gordon Meade, the Union commander here at Gettysburg, will start to call to the right flank of his army and start to pull over to that side as many troops as possible, leaving really one brigade of the Union 12th Army Corps, this brigade commanded by 62 years young George Sears Green, up here on the top of Culp's Hill. Now, Robert E. Lee, this is help starting to play into his plan. What Lee wants to do, apply pressure over on the Union left, start to draw Meade's attention in that direction so that that might open up a weak point in the Federals. Over on his left, Robert E. Lee's left, we have Richard Stoddard Yule, a 47-year-old Second Corps commander. He has taken over for Stonewall Jackson after Chancellorsville. This is Yule's uh, real test in combat here, and Yule is supposed to demonstrate, keep the Federals' attention over here, and then turn that into a general attack. When that attack starts to unfold over on the Union left, now we will start to attack the Union right. And those are some of the things we're gonna to start to follow. There'll be more fighting here on July 3rd, and it will be the longest sustained action at Gettysburg, seven full hours long. And that will, will uh, basically be a static front uh, with Confederates attacking a fixed fortified position, never breaching that line really, and the Federals just rotating in and out units and keeping up basically a constant string of fire. So let's take a walk uh, down East Confederate Avenue. Let's check out our first little stop here in our first human interest story as we explore Culp's Hill here uh, for the next uh, few minutes. All right, so we've only moved a little ways down uh, from where we were just standing. We're at uh, overlooking Spangler's Meadow, and this is uh, Augustus Coble's rock. And this is, uh, you might be able to make out uh, his rock carving because it's just rained here at Gettysburg. And you might see that it has 1st NC Regiment. Um, he is a conscript with the 1st North Carolina Infantry, specifically Company E. And he hails from the Graham, North Carolina area. If you're familiar with Greensboro, Burley, that is where he is from, and uh, Coble is a, a um, is actually uh, a veteran of the battle at Gettysburg. He goes on to serve in the 1864 campaigns when he's captured at Spotsylvania Courthouse, like many Confederates in this division that was commanded by Edward. Allegheny Johnson. They were at the tip of the Muleshoe salient there on May 12, 1864, and the bulk of that division is captured, including uh, Augustus Coble. We're down here, though, at Gettysburg, along the, almost right along the boundary between the Henry Culp and the Henry Spangler Farms. There's a, a rock wall behind Sarah, who's filming there, and looking out towards Spangler's Meadow. Well, Coble didn't fight in this specific area during the Battle of Gettysburg. In fact, his, his regiment um, is sort of behind the camera a little ways up on Lower Culp's Hill. They'll fight on Lower Culp's Hill. They'll also fight up in uh, Parity Field in that vicinity. But Coble will come back here in uh, 1913. That's the 50th anniversary. He'll travel back here with some of his sons and they will come to this area and he will engrave his name here is what we think is when he came back here for the 50th anniversary. Now, reading some of the, the feedback from the family, there's a little bit of, uh, of uh, taking uh, privilege with some of the stories uh, whenever you start to read, read about some of them, but whenever they start to talk about um, their uncle's 
service, and this was one of the, the um, uh, nieces of Albert, uh, Augustus Coble who will give us the story, she will say that uh, after the war, he is going to leave Elmira prison. He returned to North Carolina, married and raised seven kids. He returned to Gettysburg in uh, 1913 with two of his sons, and then is going to carve his name here in this rock. One of his granddaughters, <coughs> excuse me, remembered him saying that we were, that uh, him saying that the war was care was like carrying, <clears throat> excuse me. He remembered him saying the war was like carrying a two horse plow on your back until falling and then get up and then go on again. When the war was over, he threw down his gun and all of his military equipment and ran home. This was according to his granddaughter. Now, the problem was he was still in Elmira prison when this happened. He wouldn't have had any military equipment with him. He wouldn't have had a gun. So he probably just made his way back like many of the prisoners using a uh, government parole. And that would be his way of taking any sort of government transportation, drawing rations, being able to get clothing, and made his way back to North Carolina, where, again, he had seven kids, came back here in 1913, outlived his wife, and um, he will die at home at the age of 85, being a farmer down there um, near Burlington. And whenever he passed away, he had a full head of black hair and a white beard, according to the obituary. But this is one of those sites that most people don't even know it's up here. It is a rainy day. If you do try to find the, the rock carving of Coble, be careful walking up here. I almost fell flat on my face because these rocks are very slippery. But this is just one of those stories. Not every story here at Spangler Spring or at Gettysburg has to do directly with the battle. These men came back here time and time again and left their actual marks uh, on the battlefield through monuments, through roads, through plaques, and sometimes coming here with their own rock carvings. We're going to head on to Spangler's Meadow again and check out Spangler Spring, one of the most famous sites here at Gettysburg. So we haven't moved very far from our last stop at Coble's Rock. We're actually in Spangler's Meadow at the famed Spangler Spring. Now Spangler Spring has a lot of lore around it where Union and Confederate soldiers together would come down here. They would uh, drink from the waters of Spangler Spring. Um, but on, you know we do know there's Confederates here. We do know there are Union soldiers here, but they're probably not here at the same time during the battle. Now, Spangler Spring was really two holes in the ground down in this area with natural spring water coming up out of it. Um, according to uh, um, the editor of the Gettysburg Compiler, Henry Stahl, um, he said he first located the spring, which was not much more than a water-filled hole in the ground. Um, so it would not be this ornate backing that you see here. This will come around in April of 1898. The white granite that you're seeing on screen Right now, um, the canopy was actually made out of the white granite of a famous monument here at Gettysburg. It was the undesirable pieces of the white granite that would have made up the 44th New York Monument on top of Little Round Top. If you've ever seen the castle on Little Round Top, it is made out of the same stuff that you see here. So with the extra granite, they'll make that uh, kind of canopy out of it. And then the stairs that Sarah is going up right now, those would have been locally quarried, that dark granite, <clears throat> uh, by um, uh, Mr. Leitner, uh, who is uh, taking up that diabase uh, rock that is here in the Gettysburg area. You could actually come here. You could dip your, uh, you could dip a dipper down into Spangler Spring, drink from it. There was a sign that once said, "Caution: Use dipper to fill cups. Do not dip cups in the spring." That that sign hung right in the center of the canopy. There was a Dixie cup holder there at one point, um, and you can actually see the holes drilled inside of that to hold some of these signs, as well as that Dixie cup holder. But in 1937, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the CCC, who does a lot of infrastructure improvements here for the Gettysburg Battlefield and other battlefields, they come here and they are going to actually run water lines here into Spangler Spring. Um, so it is no longer the Spangler Spring water, but it's the Gettysburg town water that was carried out here. Um, and on VJ Day, Victory in Japan Day, we actually have pictures of soldiers down here who were at the German prisoner of war camp. There was a prisoner of war camp here in Gettysburg during the Second World War. 
those MPs or military police came over here and at the rocks that Sarah's pointing out right now would celebrate VJ Day with a big old case of Budweiser that was down at their feet. Um, so this is an uh, interesting story here at Spangler Springs. If you've ever been over here, we don't have Union and Confederate soldiers coming together, drinking from the same water source at the same time. They both probably used it, but it is not the spring that you see here with this beautiful canopy that was added in years later. All right, so we made our way up uh, onto the slopes of Lower Culp Hill to one of my favorite monuments, and it's the 123rd New York Monument. This is their second battle with the Army of the Potomac, their first being the Battle of Chancellorsville. And the, the soldiers in this regiment really left some fantastic accounts. Uh, some you see uh, a lot, like Rice Bull at Chancellorsville. Others you don't see as very often, like Robert Cruikshank. And, and one uh, eyewitness account I'm going to read to you here in a moment. But the monument... At Sarah's filming. Um, this was placed here, I believe, in 1889 for the cost of $4,000. You're looking at Cleo. She is the muse of history, and she is taking down the story of the veterans of the battle here at Gettysburg. Jubal Early has a fantastic quote about Cleo, the muse of history, which I cannot share in good company, um, but if you ever look up his, uh, his quote about Cleo, it's well worth time. He calls her a liar in a very um, derogatory way. But uh, this is a, a fantastic monument sitting near uh, one of the old trench lines here at Gettysburg. A lot of the trenches on uh, the battlefield over on this side of, the, of um, Gettysburg were visited heavily. We'll see more of them along the way. Um, this was the place where you should come in the first 10 years after the battle, according to John Batchelder's book. Uh, some of them will be, quote unquote, improved by the Civilian Conservation Corps, so not all of them are original, but this sits here along the trench line, and the um, quote that I'm about to read you was from someone from the 123rd New York named Robert Cruikshank. And um, so that you know, on the right flank of the Union Army, the Union 12th Army Corps are going to heavily fortify the Culp's Hills, lower and upper Culp's Hill, because he learned at the Battle of Chancellorsville, fighting behind dirt and logs will protect men's lives. And that's what they're going to do here. Take advantage of it. Even though one division commander named John White Gary said that he thought that entrenchments made men unfit for open field fighting, he let them dig in nonetheless. But Cruikshank has one of the best accounts. Our line ran through a heavy growth of timber. Here we built breastworks being uh, felling by large trees, trimming the limbs off and laying one onto the other until we had piled them breast high, hence the name breastworks. The upper timber we raised about three inches above the second timber so that we could put our guns between them and take aim, the upper limb protecting our heads. Those are known as headlocks. We then dug a ditch on our side deep enough so that when standing, our heads would come up as high as the top of the works. We left a shelf of earth next to the timber so that short men could get onto that, which would raise them high enough to shoot out. We threw earth on the enemy side of the works so that uh, a shell or solid shot would not splinter the timber of the, of the earth, would check them check the force. The limbs we had cut from the timber, we trimmed off into small branches, intertwining them in front of the works, the points of these limbs facing to the enemy, and were as high as a man's head, making it impossible for men to get through them. This is called abatee. At Chancellorsville, we learned the importance of good works and now put into use this knowledge. It's one of the best descriptions of the works here at Culp's Hill. Breast high with a headlog. We'll have intertwined um, uh, pieces of, of tree branches known as abatee, also slashings and fellings out in front, a dirt earthen parapet, and this would have been a formidable position for the Confederates to attack here at Culp's Hill. Let's check out more of the hill. So we made it up onto the slopes of Upper Culp's Hill. We're actually on the lower part of Upper Culp's Hill, which will lead down into a saddle and then lead you down to Lower Culp's Hill proper, which uh, Tim Smith of the East sometimes calls uh, Spangler's Hill. He, he refers to that as Spangler's Hill, but we'll call that Lower Culp's Hill, Upper Culp's Hill. On this portion here, you might actually be able to make out the earthworks. It's basically where the weeds start. So that would have been the original earthenworks. John Badger Batchelder, the official historian of Gettysburg, who's paid $50,000 in the 1800s to write a history of Gettysburg, 
writes about coming here to Culp's Hill as one of those things to see after the battle. But even 10 years removed from the Battle of Gettysburg in 1873, Mother Nature starting to take all these works back. Remember, they're temporary works. But if you came up here, you could still see these low mounds of earth. You could see trees that were damaged from the battle. And it was a real witness to the war. So this line itself, which is commanded by a man named George Sears Green, we'll see him at the top of the hill talk about him up there. Green is an engineer and he lays out his line and it'll be a zigzag formation. The zigzag is for a few reasons. Number one, they're following the natural topography of this hill. They're gonna to try to also create interlocking fields of fire. And that, that will be a way for the Confederates, if they came into this swale, and some of them do, they'll be hit from one side, the front, and then the other side. But the problem that, that Green has is he only has about 1,400 men to defend this position. So he will start at the top of the crest of Culp's Hill and start to tell his men like the 60th New York, the 78th, the 102nd New York, to start to spread out into intervals two to three feet apart. So that way they can start taking up more of the line. But unfortunately, he gives this order just a little bit too late. So when the Confederates around dusk, commanded by Allegheny Ed Johnson, start marching from the east towards us, the Confederates are going to get upon part of this line quicker than they thought. But down on this sector of the battlefield, we'll be within the lines of the 137th New York. 137th New York, let me say that again. Um, and they will extend their line over onto, just onto Lower Culp's Hill, spreading out. And the idea is to take up as much of the line as humanly possible while Green goes and gets more, more and more men. Well, attacking into Lower Culp's Hill and into this saddle will be some of George Maryland Stewart's brigade. He has no relation to Jeb Stewart. He's a Confederate commander, though, from the city of Baltimore, Maryland. That's why we call him Maryland Stewart. That's why his nickname. Um, and Stewart's men will be a mix of North Carolinians, Marylanders, and Virginians. Virginians and the North Carolinians do not get along. So we put some Marylanders together in between them here at the battle, and that's the makeshift makes and Dixon line, as I joke. Um, but they will start to come up into this area and start to take heavy, heavy casualties. In fact, there's a friendly fire incident. Lieutenant Randolph McKim will run back and tell the third North Carolina to, or the, sorry, the first North Carolina to start coming up and then look off in that direction. It's getting dark. We're in the woods. But look, I think that's the enemy, and he fires directly into the back of another North Carolina regiment. So confusion starts to rain down here on the battlefield. So much so, and I'm gonna read you a quick quick quote here, um, or a quick story from just below us. Um, Major, Major Goldsboro, who was a, the commander of the Maryland line, as they're called, the 1st Maryland Battalion here, um, he is gonna say that some Federals wandered into the newly won works that the Confederates came up here and took. Captain John W. Torsh of Company E, whilst urging his men to fire as rapidly as possible, was approached by a Federal officer and, peremptor and, and peremptorily ordered to cease firing by this Federal captain. The captain had received no instructions to obey officers in blue uniforms, and he therefore declared he'd be damned if he would, and seizing the, the astonished lover of the Union by the throat, dragged him into, the, into my presence and demanded in an excited manner that I should give him the devil for coming inside of our lines and interfering with him in the discharge of his duties. Major Goldsboro sent the poor unfortunate prisoner to the rear, Later on, another Federal accidentally in the dark wandered into the Confederate lines. This man was on horseback, this uh, Federal. He will say, what corps is this? And seizing the horse by the bridle and its reins, a reply came, a rebel corps, sir, and you are my prisoner. The officer was most likely Harry G. Egbert of the 1st Corps, a staff officer who got off of his horse, removed his belt, sword, and pistol, remarking to the Confederate, take them, sir, they are yours and fairly won. What happened down here on Lower Culp's Hill was it was dark, confusion of battle. Part of the 12th Corps, the mass majority of it, are sent to the Union left. Now that that crisis on the left at the Little Round Tops, or Little Round Top, Culp's Hill, I'm sorry, the wheat field, Peach Orchard, and other places are now coming to a head and a close. The 12th Corps was sent back here in the dark, 
going back to their old entrenchments. They're wandering into Confederates who had taken it here in the midst of the Culp's Hill battle. Confederates are attacking towards our camera up into this line. We're just behind the Union lines and it becomes a confused night action down here and the tension will be running high. So what we want to do is uh, shift up and talk about the other flank of the Union Army. Everybody knows on the left, we got Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, the 20th Maine, Strong Vincent and all that. But here on the Union right, we have a similar situation involving the 137th New York Infantry and Colonel David Ireland. One of the soldiers in the 137th New York Infantry that's fighting here, holding the far right flank of the Union line on Culp's Hill, is a man named Charles Engel, and he's fighting in Company B of the 137th New York uh, Infantry Regiment. And he has a wonderful collection of letters that his descendants have transcribed, made available online, and I was able to reach out to one of them and receive permission to be able to share some of Charles Engel's um, writings here with you today as we're bringing in the eyewitness theme, um, bringing the stories, what um, soldiers saw, um, what they remembered immediately after the battle. So Charles Engel has been in the 137th New York since August of 1862. Um, he will serve through the end of the war and he will survive. So he survives the Battle of Gettysburg, he survives the Civil War itself. Now Charles writes a letter almost weekly to his wife Charlotte and that's where we get this wonderful treasure trove of his writings. Um, he's 25 years old when he's fighting here at the Battle of Gettysburg. He will live until 1918. Um, at the time of the Battle of Gettysburg he and his wife have two children including a baby son who was born in April of 1863 who he has not seen yet and he writes about this uh, baby son and wanting to be able to go home and see his family. Well, Charles Engel writes a letter on July 9th, 1863 to his wife. So this is in the immediate aftermath, if you will, of the Battle of Gettysburg. He's writing to let her know that he's safe and he's starting to try to make sense of what he's seen, what he's experienced in this intense fighting that happens here on Culp's Hill. But he's also reflecting on other news, other war news that is coming and that's reaching the Army of the Potomac, including the news of the surrender of the city of Vicksburg on the Mississippi River, out in Mississippi Western Theater. That news is coming. It's being known by the soldiers of the Army of the Potomac. It's reaching the northern home front. So even as Charles is writing after Gettysburg and he's starting to process what he's experienced, what he's been through here on Culp's Hill, he's uh, taking interest, he's taking um, excitement in the news of this great Union victory out in the Western Theater as well. So on July 9th, he writes on that subject, I feel very much encouraged about the war. Vicksburg is ours. And if we have good luck here, he's referring to the Pennsylvania campaign, I think that will use, use them up. But many a brave man has got to fall, and we know not who. He goes on, he's describing some of what's happened to him in what we now call the Gettysburg Campaign, and he summarizes the Battle of Gettysburg, saying the Battle of Gettysburg was a hard one, but it was a complete victory. We whip them at every point. I think it is a good thing that the Rebs went up into Pennsylvania. I wish they was farther north. I think we would lay the whole of them. And then, three days later, Charles Engel is going to have a little more time. He's going to write another letter to his wife, Charlotte. So at this point, the unit is camped near Antietam Battlefield. It's July 12th. He even says in his letter, near Antietam Battlefield. And he begins to reflect in more depth on what he experienced at Gettysburg. And this is where we get his eyewitness primary source account of the fighting that happened here. So he says, he's uh, referring to the Confederate army. He's hoping at this point toward the, the end of the Gettysburg campaign that Meade will be able to you know, fight again before Lee's army returns to Virginia. So he begins saying, um, but the Southern army is terribly demoralized and I hope Meade will chase them up. They were never so badly whipped as they were at Gettysburg. Green's brigade suffered more than any and the 137th lost more men than any other regiment in the brigade. Our brigade fought at least 10,000 men Thursday night. The rest of our corps was taken to a weak point and we was left alone. 
The 137th wouldn't suffered so much if the Rebs hadn't flanked us and got in our rear. We thought it was our men and hollered at them and told them not to fire in our men, but we soon found out the difference and we was ordered out. There was one of the boys wounded close to where I was, and when the regiment left, he cried for help, but there was such a confusion, no one noticed him, but I took pity on him and tried to help him. The bullets came thick and close, but I got his knapsack off and got him up. I couldn't carry him and my gun. I got him to lean on me, and I got him out of the worst firing. I tried to get him out of danger, but he couldn't go any further, so I left him by the side of a rock. He was a corporal out of another company. He had been out skirmishing and got over the breastworks in our company. I would like to hear from our wounded boys. This hot weather is hard from them. There ain't but 333 men left in the 137th, but some of the wounded will come back and the prisoners, so we will have over 400. If the 3rd Brigade hadn't fought so hard and held, the, held that point, the South would have gained the battle. If they had broke our lines, it would have been a harder battle than it was. Dear Charlotte, I hope this war won't last much longer. I want to come home to my family. I want to see you all so bad I can hardly stand it, but I want to have this trouble settled first. We are having very hard times, but I am willing to endure most anything if I only come out alive so I can return home to you once more. But I may as well die here as to have the South conquer. If it is my lot to fall here, perhaps you and the children can live in a free country. And so those are the details as Charles Engel remembers them of this hard fight. And he doesn't have the high perspective that we get now as we get to play armchair generals and we get to read the battle reports. He knows about the fighting. He knows about this incident of friendly fire and you know his difficulties in trying to save a wounded man. And he's bringing meaning to it. He's recognizing that a great victory has been won. And he's also recognizing that his regiment, the 137th New York infantry has played a major role in that victory by holding this ground where we have the honor and the privilege to stand here today. I just came off the other shoot, 1,409 seconds, and I've just arrived. I have no idea what you guys have talked about so far, but man, do I see a lot of things to talk about around right now. We are along George Sears Green's line. If we're talking about July 2nd, that means he's just got a handful of regiments to defend all of Upper Culp's Hill, maybe a little bit of Lower Culp's Hill if you talked about that um, already. So we're in front of the 149th New York. You can see some of the works that uh, these and other units would have constructed behind. Uh, again, sometimes they were earth, sometimes they were logs, sometimes they were stone or a combination of all of those things. And lucky for those, because that's really going to help George Sears Green's troops to be able to hold this position against a, a pretty numerically superior Confederate force. I'm not sure if anybody says that without those earthworks, it would have been a sure thing that Green's New Yorkers, tough as they might be fighting um, against these determined Confederates, could have possibly held on at this point. Now, I can only guess as to what uh, our next guest, Chris White, who you've already been seeing, is going to talk about here, but there are a number of stories, because here we are right in the middle of uh, sort of Green's line, and they are being hard pressed. And unlike the following day, when you come to Culp's Hill, you might see monuments on the other side of the road for the large number of soldiers who can come in and relieve the front line. You have a little bit of that going on on July, on July 2nd, but by July 3rd, you've got endless array and, and uh, stream of Union reinforcements coming in. So we don't really have that on the second. These are desperate moments, and I'm looking forward to what Chris is going to say here. So glad I'm back, and uh, I'm glad to be here at Gettysburg 160. You ready, Mr. White? Oh, yeah. All right, here he goes. So um, uh, thanks, Gary. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> uh, I want to... Um, thank everyone for watching so far. Please share this with your friends and with your family and click that subscribe and like button um, over on Facebook as well as on YouTube. We really hope that you uh, keep watching all these videos. Um, but this area that we're standing near is the 149th New York Monument. We're roughly near the center of George Sears Green's line here at at Culp's Hill. And the 149th New York, um, I'm gonna tell a few different stories here of the New Yorkers, some Louisianans are coming up against them, um, and maybe one other story, but 
Um, the the bar relief that Sarah's focusing in on right now shows William Lilly. Um, he is the color bearer of the 149th New York. Allegedly, 80 bullets will pierce the flag of the 149th New York during the battle. And at one point, the flag staff will break into two. And Lily will go take some knapsack straps that would hold on your um, hold your your blanket down on your knapsack. We'll also go get some some hardtack boxes or ammo boxes, slats from those, and really put back together the flag. Unfortunately for Lily, he is killed, uh, mortally wounded at the Battle of Wahatchee here just a few months after the Battle of Gettysburg. But that's probably the most famous story to come out of here. The second probably most famous part of the 149th New York will be their colonel themselves, Henry Barnum. Barnum is wounded at a place called Malvern Hill. He's shot through the hip and amazingly survives. It's one of the most famous photographs of a uh, wounded soldier to come out during the war. Yeah. He puts a probe actually right through it. But he comes back to serve in the army and serves here at Gettysburg. And in fact, he's so proud of his service at Malvern Hill, he's a Medal of Honor recipient on top of that, he is going to name his child, who was born in 1863, Malvern Hill Barnum. And Malvern Hill Barnum will go on to the United States Military Academy at West Point, graduate from there, and serve in the Spanish-American War and the First World War. And in fact, 36 years and one day after the Battle of Gettysburg, Malvern Hill Barnum is wounded charging up San Juan Hill during the Spanish-American War, just like his father was wounded in war. He is wounded as well. Now, the one story that I want to talk about, we're kind of focusing on eyewitness accounts. Um, we'll focus on, I don't know if I find the, the right one, um, this, this regiment. So when we talk about eyewitness accounts, sometimes we have one account, maybe two, maybe three. And that's, as a historian, we want to have more than one account to try to match things up. You know, it's like playing a game of, of uh, Civil War telephone. You know, who said what and how does it end up in the end? Well, even whenever we have eyewitness accounts, they don't always tell us everything that happened. And there's an event that took place here during the midst of the July 2nd battle between the 149th New York and Jesse Williams, Louisiana Brigade. Now, Jesse Williams, Louisiana Brigade will start charging up against this hillside. The Confederates who were hit by the fire up here said they, they, their line looked like it fell back like a drunken person because it was hit so hard with that lead, it wavered like a drunken person walking down the street. And later on, the Louisianans will say they got so close to this line, when this battle ends, they are going to be able to hear the Federals talking that night because some of these men are so close to the Federal lines. In fact, some of the Creoles say they made it into the Union lines. Some of the Federals say they didn't. Regardless, there's an incident that took place here between federal officers. In the midst of this battle, at one point, Barnum is going to give an order to kind of reef shift his line around a little bit. Someone will misconstrue this order. And three companies, we'll call that uh, approximately 120 men, will start pulling off the line here and start to retreat. And as they're retreating off in this direction, there are reinforcements being sent here from the 11th Corps and the 1st Corps. And as they come down into this area, um, one man said the fire that they were initially receiving was most likely from the right three companies of the 149th New York. They are firing off towards the 137th New York. They might have actually been firing into their own men at one point. And the 137th started to fall back a little bit as they start firing off in that direction. They see the 137th start to fall back because they're being outflanked on the right. That's what you want to do in a Civil War battle. Find the end of someone's line, get around it, push them up. And as the 137th starts to fall back, Barnum tries to kind of meet this, maybe check the fire of his men. When um, trying to beat this growing threat, unfortunately, the order to change the front of the three right companies was understood by the line officers, the captains and the lieutenants, for the regiment to fall back, which it did so in good order. But rather than meeting the threat, the regiment began to mistakenly retreat from the line. Captain John Kellogg, a 1st Corps staff officer, will ride up here. He's attached to Lysander Cutler's brigade, and Cutler is a tough old bird. Um, you don't want to mess with Lysander Cutler. He was trying to get reinforcements down here. When he saw the 149th falling back, he saw an officer leading to the rear, and Kellogg told him, 
told this, this officer, I will cut down with his saber a cowardly field officer of another corps who was endeavoring to march his men out of the trenches. Quickly, this situation was rectified and the regiment dove back into the trenches. Now, Colonel Barnum would say, this happened. We did start falling back. In fact, we had to get back into the line, but he won't say who the officer was. He said, with a single exception among the officers and but very few among the men, all perform their duty to my entire satisfaction. There was yet another witness to this scene, a man named Rufus Dodge. You might've heard of him from the 6th Wisconsin. Dodge said, I remember distinctly his, Kellogg, this, this uh, staff officer, driving back in the night on Culp's Hill, a colonel whom he would probably have shot if he persisted in running away. So we have three men down here, this Captain Kellogg of Cutler's staff, Colonel Barnum, as well as Rufus Dawes. All of them witness the same thing. They see this portion of the line go away. They see this man being read the riot act and almost shot or hit with a sword and all the New Yorkers coming back into the line, but no one will name who it is. Was it Barnum? Maybe. Was it his second in command, Charles B. Randall? Maybe. They refer to him as a colonel. So those are your two options if that was the case. But remember, it was still dark up here. So when we talk about these eyewitness actions, they don't always tell us everything that's happening. Sometimes, man, this is too good to be true. Sometimes it's, boy, I wish they would have told us a little bit more. And that's the case in this one. I wish they would have told us just a little bit more about what happened here on Culp's Hill. But remember that when you were historians or sitting there trying to figure out what happened here, sometimes the, the combatants themselves didn't want to tell us the whole truth. I hope you don't mind if I just add on here. What an incredible, and I've never heard those three put together before. I mean, that's usually the historian's gold mine. You have three different people talking about the same thing, and yet we come up short. We come up short because they didn't tell us everything, and did they not tell us to protect reputations or because they were talking about themselves? Fascinating stuff, Chris. You coming back? No, let's move on to our next stop. All right, good, let's move on to the next stop. My arms are ready. Here we've walked further up Upper Culp's Hill along George Sears Green's line here, the earthworks right in front of me, of course. You'll be able to see when we show you that I'm actually sitting on a rock where two of Matthew Brady's photo assistants are actually sitting in uh, mid-July of 1863. You can see that these works were more than just earth. You can see, I believe, the stone and the log. You can see the way it curves around there. So in this sense, with this boulder and what remains of the works, we have eyewitnesses to Gettysburg here at Gettysburg 160. It also allows you to really see that even at the time, you know, you could see the open nature of the ground on the other side of the works and somehow sitting here brings you back in time a little bit. And thanks to William Frazanito who discovered this location, taking all the photos out and finding them in the first place. I can sit here like his photo assistant and ponder a little bit better what it was like on that warm summer day. All right, so we moved up towards uh, the top part or the summit of Upper Culp's Hill. You might be able to see the summit up behind me. The 1895 War Department Tower is up there. A monument to the 60th New York is up in that direction. George Sears Green's pointing down towards us as well. You probably can't see him, but we'll visit him at our next stop, which is our last stop on this video. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to talk about here um, is artillery fire. So we don't have too many artillery pieces here at Culp's Hill. On the top of the hill, we have five pieces that, that are up there, three 10-pounder Parrot guns and two Napoleons that were stationed on top of the heights. They would fire off towards Benner's Hill a little ways, but they couldn't depress their barrels into this area as much as you would think. Well, um, coming off of this height was James Wadsworth. So at the top of the hill is where the 1st Corps and the 12th Corps come together. They have to have a, a, a junction point, and that is where James Wadsworth's 1st Division of the 1st Corps, famously known for the Iron Brigade, is up there. And then we would meet George Sears Green's 3rd Brigade, 2nd Division, 12th Corps, and would go off in this direction. Well, Wadsworth, who had his headquarters on top of the hill, is looking out and seeing these Confederates coming up the hill. And in this sector, we would see uh, John uh, Marshall Jones, Rum Jones, uh, as he is known, because he likes to drink, West Point graduate, comes up this hill. He is wounded in action. His second in command is wounded in action. And the, the um, uh, co command of the brigade falls to a guy named Dungan. Well, in the meantime, as these Confederates are pushing up here, Wadsworth, this Union First Corps Division commander, rides over to Cemetery Hill. 
he goes over there into the first core sector over to East Cemetery Hill, and he finds Charles Wainwright. Wainwright is a fellow New Yorker. Wadsworth's from the Geneseo Valley of New York. Wainwright is also from New York, and he finds Wainwright. He's in charge of all the Union First Corps artillery pieces, and he said, I want you to put fire over onto Culp's Hill. And Wainwright um, is a guy who's just haughty and supercilious, and he really thinks highly of himself, but he's a pretty good gunner. Leaves us a fantastic diary, one of the best eyewitnesses yeah. to battle. He is going to tell, tell Wadsworth, hey, man, there are Union troops over there. And during the Civil War, we used direct line of sight. If you see it, you can shoot it. Today, we use indirect fire a lot of times with artillery. Put a forward observer forward. They'll call it back. There's map coordinates, and you call in fire on a certain position. Well, that's not how we do it in the Civil War. So Wainwright says, no, no, no. I don't think this is a good idea. Wainwright... And me, this is just me, pantomiming, probably did one of these. I have a star, you have a bird, meaning he's a general and Wainwright's a colonel. So in this uh, description, he said, uh, he asked, if I could not fire into the woods so as to strike the enemy, Wainwright said. Wadsworth then came over himself and pointed out a spot where he said the Rebs were and where he wanted me to fire. Because initially, Wainwright talks to a staff officer. He says, no, 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 we're not doing this. Wainwright shows up himself. Wainwright still refused to fire over here. He protested that the point where he was aiming towards was within our lines, probably standing right up in, in the area where we are. While the division commander retorted, he had just come from over here and knew exactly where our lines were. Wainwright finally relented and said uh, that one of the guns of Battery L, 1st New York Ar Artillery, George Breck's battery, are allowed to fire some shots in this direction. But the caveat was, hey, General, you want me to fire this gun? You aim it yourself. So the General comes over, aims the gun, starts lobbing shells, Wadsworth rides away, feeling pretty good about himself. And a few moments later, up came a, uh, uh, up came by not a happy, staff officer uh, from the 12th Corps who rode up demanding, wanting to know why they were shelling their own lines. They could tell even in this din of battle that the shells were coming in from behind them. Friendly fire, which is I think one of the worst names for any sort of fire. Anyone shooting at you is not friendly, even just by accident. And this 12th Corps staff officer rides up to Wainwright. That's all Wainwright needed to hear. The general was wrong, but he had to follow the orders because on any battlefield, stars outrank birds. And so here we have this general trying to impose his will on this battle. We'll see the same thing happen between Winfield Scott Hancock and Henry Hunt on July 3rd, 1863 over at Pickett's Charge. This is that lesser known story of a general stepping in where he shouldn't. But this is also an area where we'll see Confederates move up into here. This rock formation that we're about to talk about was actually integrated into George Sears Green's lines. Green's lines will run down here with earthen fortifications. Eventually, they'll come down to this beautiful rock outcropping, which will later, after the war, turn into an advertisement for um, some interesting products. Yeah, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, the battle three days. They campaign a lot more than that. And then they might talk about the aftermath of the battle. But I, I find the, the days, weeks, months, and decades after the battle to be equally fascinating. And here we are just about four years after the battle. And you uh, could look at a photo. We'll put it up there for you. Uh, that would show what the Union Breastworks had become. And as Chris said, they had become an advertisement. This rock here said Rogers liver pills. And that largest rock there, one photographed in 1867, at least three or four different times by uh, photographers in the area, Hooflin's German bitters. And I don't, you know, I'll give Rogers somewhat of a pass. I mean, you can see Haynes or Kane's liver pills on a little round top, but Hooflin's seemed to seek out historic sites specifically to I would say desecrate them in order to advertise for their product. And Hooflin's, I've read some of their stuff. That It's going to cure depression of spirits and constant imaginings of evil. I mean, it sounds a little snake oily to me. Sounds like it was a whole lot of colored liquor at that point. Sounds like they might have put someone in the crowd saying, hey, it saved me and my, my whole family. You should buy some. And if you go around to other Civil War battlefields where uh, you know Hooflin's uh, was able to sell things, look on the original foundation of the Gaines's Mill in Virginia. 
Virginia, Hooflands, German bitters, John Brown's Fort, Hooflands, German bitters, everywhere, every historic site, it seems, to fall in victim to some of this uh, early uh, desecration. And in many cases, this land had been private land. It hadn't become a battlefield. So there's reason number 742 why we need to preserve these places where American soldiers fought, bled, and died. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I, th I think that uh, one of the interesting things about Culp's Hill are the rock formations. People um, really love to go to Devil's Den. I encourage you to do so. But getting up here and now with our friends at the Gettysburg Foundation and the National Park Service who have helped to open up the area up here on Culp's Hill to make it a little bit more uh, um, accessible. One of the cool rocks that you can come up to is known as the Sharpshooter's Rock. It's also called Wads Rock. And down below us is where a bunch of Confederates would get behind it, and it shows up in uh, some of the sketches after the battle. And it gives you an idea of one perspective looking up here while we have another perspective just over here looking down the hill. So you get the idea of just how, how much of these eyewitnesses, if you will, if these rocks would have been up here in Culp's Hill. Yeah, just real quick, I forgot, I can't believe I failed to mention that. So Forbes was covering this side of the line, and we are lucky that he came here so soon and was able to get in, showing a not photographic, but a different version. And according to him uh, on the drawing over there, there are logs sticking up all over the place. It looks revetted, like 1864 stuff. So they made initial sketches, then they improved them later. So you have to take that into account a little bit. But here you're looking at more eyewitnesses to Gettysburg. As William Frazanito said, the things they witnessed those warm summer evenings forever locked within. All right, so we have made it to the summit of Culp's Hill, and this was a, a portion of the hill that Confederates claimed they needed scaling ladders to get up, and I can see that because if you go just past the 66 Ohio's monument here, you look down, this is a very steep hill. Now, the Confederates of John Jones's brigade will come up across um, the Rock Creek, which is below us, cross today what is the road and then eventually will cross their way up into the wood line here to attack the summit of Culp's Hill which is fortified by Green's men. Now in this maneuver uh, some of the Confederates as well as the Federals talked about these Confederates being on dress parade. They were moving so beautifully because the top of the hill they could see out towards a place called Benner's Hill near where the Confederates were advancing from their initial jump off point. Then they'll descend down into the Rock Creek Valley and then towards us. I describe it going across the Glacier then down through the moat of Rock Creek and then up here to the parapet to the castle that is Culp's Hill. Um, but some of the, the uh, Virginians who were part of uh, the brigade up here of John Jones will talk about coming up here and making it within uh, just a few feet of the lines out here. But as they kept getting closer, the fire kept being poured upon them by the Federals. And Colonel Abel Goddard of the uh, uh, 60th New York is going to jump over top of the works and charge forward to try to capture a few of the flags of the Confederates who are pushing up here on top of Culp's Hill. Now he claimed he took about 50 men with him. His chaplain was very exact saying 56 men went over top of the works here uh, in the dark on July 2nd, charging down to help try to take those works. And he said um, that they leapt across the works and among the Confederates that they came upon were two officers or with the with the, the Federals were two officers and they took uh, times two flags, meaning two flags, one a brigade color and one a regimental color. The brigade flag was the Confederate first national flag. And according to author Richard Rollins, the regimental banner was most likely that of the 25th Virginia Infantry. And they were captured within about 20 paces of the 60th works. According to one witness, he said seven rebel officers were found dead on the ground, covered by the colors and the color guard. The effects of our fire were so terrible that the flags were abandoned and the prisoners were afraid to either advance or retreat. The color bearers were both killed. Remembered one of the chaplains up here on top of Culp's Hill. So the Confederates will keep pushing, getting close, close, but they can't get close enough. And one of the reasons they can't get up here, number one, is that volume of fire. Number two, the earthworks. Number three, just the natural topography. But number four, and most importantly, is the guy we'll go visit here for a moment, and that's George Sears Green himself. Uh, Green's monument is up here on the Gettysburg battlefield. He's the third New York general to receive a uh, portrait statue here on the Gettysburg battlefield. Number one being Governor Kimball Warren, number two, Henry Warner Slocum, and number three, George Sears Green. Green was described um, as um, he conducted his, conducted his brigade drills. He was a West Point graduate, about, about 62 years old at the time of the battle, thick set, five feet, 10 inches high, of dark complexion, 
with iron gray hair, full gray beard and mustache, gruff in manner and stern in appearance, but withal an excellent officer and under a rough, a rough exterior possessing a kind heart. In the end, the men learned to love and respect him as they did in the beginning, they feared him. And this was saying a good deal on the subject. He knew how to drill, how to command, and in the hour of peril, how to care for his command. And the men respected him accordingly, is how they describe George Sears Green. In fact, uh, he will lose his wife and four of his children early in his army career um, due to disease on the frontier. He will remarry. Uh, one of his sons will serve aboard the USS Monitor. Uh, his daughter will marry the son of Hannibal Day, one of the oldest generals here at Gettysburg who served with U.S. regulars over in the wheat field. And Green himself is remembered by his men up here on Culp's Hill, pointing down over top towards his works and towards his line. Gary? Good. Thanks, Chris. So one thing is Sarah's been showing us some great views of George Sears Green, the way he was supposed to be seen. The way, what I mean by that is that Chris, when we started this video, was actually starting in the old road. See, the old road up Lower Culp's Hill from Spangler Spring is pretty much original from the 1890s, early 1900s. But the 1897 road that took people up Slocum Avenue to the top of Culp's Hill used to take a completely different course. It veered out over along the line of works, big uh, retaining walls to try to deal with that land. And then it went right where Chris was standing. He was standing right in the old road, and then it would curve around behind the camera, and when people came to the summit of Culp's Hill, what would they see? George Sears Green shining above all on the hill that he very much helped to preserve. Now the road is over behind there and when you drive up you see his posterior. So sometimes going from wagons to cars actually has you know real effect upon the presentation of the battlefield. One last thing about George Sears Green, born 1801, died 1899, didn't want any other part of any other century. Credit to Tim Smith for that comment. Chris? And let's uh, finish off our video by walking just across the street to the 1895 War Department Tower. Um, the War Department Tower up here, you could still climb. Again, was, was placed here in 1895. It was designed by Colonel Cope, who was on the Battlefield uh, Commission here, their official engineer of the War Department um, uh, Commission here at Gettysburg. But this eyewitness um, is actually one of the monuments. No, there are no bullet holes here at Gettysburg in the monuments. They weren't here. But in 1957, these two guns, as well as this plaque to David Kinsey's battery, stood here on top of Culp's Hill. And in May of 1957, the President of the United States made Gettysburg his home, and that's Dwight David Eisenhower. Eisenhower uh, invited many diplomats to his house here at the Eisenhower farm. And one of those were, uh, were old officers some of those were old officers who came here from World War II, including in May of 1957, Bernard Law Montgomery. Uh, if you know him, he's uh, fought in Al Alamein, he fought at Khan, he was at Operation Market Garden, he was there throughout the movie Patton. And Monty and, and Ike will go across the battlefield and explore the battlefield. Ike loved this place. His first visit was during uh, June of 1915, I'm sorry, May of 1915, when he was a cadet at West Point. He comes back here, he lives here, he loves the battlefield. Mamie said, the first lady, that he knew every rock on the battlefield. And that was not a compliment because she was so <laughs> bored listening to him. But Ike will come up here on top of Little Round, or on top of Culp's Hill, and he'll start to look at this placard. This is an eyewitness to them being here. Um, and he is going to say to, to Monty, and there's a picture of this, and this is according to the Times Democrat, because there's all kinds of reporters around here. Ike said, noting a marker which said only five defenders were wounded at one spot on Culp's Hill, Eisenhower turned to Montgomery with this bit of advice. Get in the artillery or the cavalry. They discussed the position of the guns and how they could not figure out how the cannoneers could depress their barrels far enough to hit any of the approaching infantry, not realizing the guns were up here for counter battery fire. The pair also climbed up into the War Department Tower with the president bringing along his own map, and at the top of the old observation platform, they could not quite figure out some of the terrain. Ike blamed the trees, undoubtedly, which had grown up since the battle. But the visit was not without controversy. And there's a reason I bring this up. Monty will kind of look in one of those Napoleons. And then the reporters, like they love to do, they're going to start peppering him with questions. This was going on for two days. And finally, Ike and, and Monty start letting their guard down a little bit. And 
Monty um, was asked, you know, you know, was Meade or Lee, should they be criticized for their actions here at Gettysburg one way or the other? And Eisenhower, being the diplomat, said, look, I live here. I represent both the North and the South. He, Monty, can talk. It was some of the, the finest troop movements in military history that you ever saw. But in the end, the two old warriors agreed that both commanders, Lee and Meade, should have been sacked. And for their performance, according to Times Magazine, this set off, <laughs> this set off um, a complete firestorm in the South. Southern editors took sniper positions atop the editorial pages while columnists, of course, made up the fifth column. Southern blood boils was said on top of big, bold letters on top of uh, newspapers, screamed the Jackson, Mississippi News. Ironically, the outcry was so bad because of Lee, who lost the battle. Yeah, we should sack him. No one got upset that, that uh, anyone said Meade should be sacked. They got upset because Lee should be sacked. And they went on to say that the, um, they went to their ink wells and fired a battery of 155 millimeter ink pots at both of these men. It got so bad that two weeks later during the weekly press conference, Ike was asked about these comments on top of, of Culp's Hill, what they had said about Robert E. Lee. And you can actually watch that on YouTube. You can bring it up. I've watched it myself. And Ike tries to laugh it off. At another point, men start sending him um, uh, straps of leather where you sharpen your razor on it, saying they're going to whip the president for what they had said about Robert E. Lee. He has to get on to, on to, the, um, get on to national news and say, I love Robert E. Lee. In fact, his portrait's in the Oval Office. I like Ben Franklin. I like George Washington. I'm all about history. But it created such a firestorm up here in May of 1957 that President Eisenhower had to start refighting the Battle of Gettysburg, the man who won World War II, because they were asked an innocent question and it set an uproar in the South and part of the North. There's one reason we need to study Culp Hill a little bit more. That is awesome, Chris. I just want to say the sweet irony that both of those commanders submitted resignations after the battle. I mean, can't two guys who were so dissatisfied either with their own performance or with that of their president that, that submitted their resignation cannot an accomplished World War II general even suggest that maybe they weren't the greatest generals in American history? Yeah. Ironic. Yeah, I mean, I, I love it. And I'll just uh, finish by saying that Ike said, his four top Americans were Franklin, Washington, Lincoln, and Lee, and all four of his portraits were in the Oval Office. That's how he has to defend himself. The guy who helped liberate Europe becomes the 34th president of the United States. I mean, I would still find that as a, both an entertaining and a baffling story, all told. And it played out right here. It played out right here. So this is another witness to a historic moment. Is it as historic as the battle? Absolutely not. But it is a fun story to tell up here on Little Round Top, and also tell, or up on top of Culp's Hill but it also tells us the thoughts going into the centennial of the, the Civil War, the 100th anniversary. You know, passion still ran very deeply in the United States. Um, and who was, you know, the president can't say that, and by God, Monty can't say that, or Brit, you know, you, you can't say that about Robert E. Lee. But not I, about George Gordon Meade. I just wonder, Chris, <laughs> could you see a day in the future where people will be on Little Round Top and mistake it with Culp's Hill? Wouldn't that be a beautiful thing if Culp's Hill gets the due that it once got, once got after the Battle of Gettysburg when this was the most popular spot on the battlefield? I, I agree. I love Little Round Top, but I love Culp's Hill even more. I hope that people get up here. And one of the reasons I'm saying Little Round Top is because one of the famous stops during that tour was the day before over at Little Round Top between the two of them. Um, but with that, I think that wraps up our eyewitness to uh, uh, Culp's Hill. I want to thank Sarah Byerly for being in front and behind the camera, Gary Edelman for jumping into the action, late arrival. <laughs> and uh, for you for watching these videos. Please again, click that subscribe button, hit the bell notification, head to battlefields.org, learn more about what we do, maybe become a member of the American Battlefield Trust, or at least, you know, learn more about American history by coming to our website. And of course, tell your teacher friends, your students that you know, we have all kinds of free content for students of any age over at battlefields.org and especially at youtube.com. Check out our YouTube channel. We have a lot of content yeah, for the 160 do. series. Gary, Great. anything to add? Thanks, Chris. No, I'll just second. Thank you so much for watching, for all of your attention and for supporting battlefield preservation and education as we're at Gettysburg 160.